Hi, I'm going to take you through an illustrated investigation of the origins and efficacy of inspiration. Or a translation of that might be, draws pretty pictures, likes to use big words. <laughs> All right, today we're talking about inspiration, all of us, and the idea that inspiration can lead to creativity. Creativity can lead us to progress and change and affect, you know, real, real change, not only in an individual, but throughout the world, right? No. Uh, it actually turns out that inspiration is not necessary, okay? I'm, I want to set you straight on a few things. The first is that if you live in the United States of America, congratulations, you're on top, okay? There's actually no reason for you to ever act or be inspired at all, really, okay? It turns out that your daily life, your existence, is the envy of 80% of this world's population. They all wish they had it as good as you do right now. Okay. So really, today's talk is about how inspiration is dangerous, it can be disrupted, and it can poke holes in your neat, comfortable, safe existence, and we need to, we need to stop in its tracks. Okay, think of it this way. Inspiration is like a dangerous, wild animal that is loose in the closet of your mind. And we have got to stop this thing before it makes some sort of huge mess. Now, that will require constant vigilance. Okay? In, you let your guard down for a moment, inspiration is just waiting to ambush you. Okay? There's all kinds of inspiration and ideas out there. And really, all it takes is one simple moment where you're not paying attention to let down your guard. It can have far-reaching complications and consequences. Okay? For example, 1977, the Dodgers game, Dusty Baker is rounding third base, headed to home. He runs by his teammate, Glenn Burks, who has his arms up in sort of the universal human expression for, hey, we're doing awesome. And he inadvertently, accidentally invents the high five. <laughs> Didn't mean to do it, just happened, the right place, the right time. There you go, far reaching content. <laughs> Mozart began composing music at the age of five years old, right? He didn't really have any choice. He had this bizarre ability, he heard music. He heard, you know, phrases and, 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 and uh, you know, like actual music in everyday sounds and noises, okay? He's five, he can't really hold it against him, he had to do something, he started writing it down. Leonardo da Vinci, classic Renaissance man, would sketch and draw like crazy. Okay? He would start out with, uh, you look at his sketchbooks in, the, in the, uh, the, the museums in London, he's got eddies of water, like you know, just studying you know, how does water ripple around a board that I'm going to stick in the stream right here. Eddies of water leads to designs for fountains, engineering and bridge works, which lead to uh, military hardware designed to roar across the battlefield, severing limbs from people before he finally gets distracted by a squirrel or something shiny. <laughs> <laughs> da Vinci actually is a terrific example for inspiration avoidance. Okay? This is a guy capable of 15 paradigm exploding ideas before breakfast, right? And his total completed works number all 24. Okay, so what about Leo? 1800s, you have Wilhelm Röntgen, who is experimenting and messing about with uh, cathode ray tubes and electricity. Right? Inadvertently, accidentally discovers a process or phenomenon that lets him take pictures of the bones in his wife's hand. Okay? The next thing you know, we have that. Uh, we have Steve Jobs in 1972 in this country, who drops out of college after just six months, and then drops into a calligraphy class. Class. He's not enrolled, he's not getting any credit, he's just interested, he starts showing up. The next thing you know, we have computers with multiple typefaces and proportionately spaced fonts. Okay, so really what I want to get across here is the idea that there's always going to be these people, these weirdos, these outliers, people who not only revel in inspiration and innovation, but are capable of affecting others. Okay, so you want to watch out for them. Now, you have a natural immunity against being inspired. It actually takes a great deal of effort to get a human being up and motivated and doing things. Okay, but your natural immunity is not enough. In order to really be safe, there's some things we can do, practical application of some skills that can make you safe and totally insane. Now, to begin with, we're all born as selfish hedonists. Okay? You start life looking after number one. Okay? And actually, within a relatively short amount of time, you get really good at it. You, you have an entire family bent, you know, wrapped around your finger, where you're 24 know, 7 addressing your every need, your every whim, your every desire, looking after your physical needs, your emotional needs. Okay? Now, that's a skill that we all have early on, and then we just, it just sort of drops off the radar as we go in society. I'm here to tell you that you can actually use some of these skills again. The next time you're feeling motivated or inspired, think about, just take a quick inventory. How many of your needs aren't being met right then and there? Are, are you hungry? Are you, are you tired? Do you need a nap? Do you need to be entertained? Do you need a hug? Okay. You can channel your inner younger self to save your older self from making a potentially dangerous mistake. 
<laughs> we are creatures of routine, we like to function in routines. Okay? Think about how many times you've been through this routine. You wake up, you eat, you work, you eat some more, you work, you play a little bit, you eat, you go to bed. Okay? A good routine is self-perpetuating. You can keep doing it forever and ever without any sort of variation. And it insulates you, it protects you against change or variety. Okay? I recently made the mistake of participating in a life-changing trip uh, to an impoverished third world nation. Okay, I spent a, a little over a week tracing around the countryside of Haiti. We visited uh, an elementary school up in the mountains, very rural, no running water. We were the first white people they'd ever seen. We visited a hospital uh, that's you know, dealing with a cholera epidemic. We visited uh, places that are still sort of in the middle of reconstruction or in disaster relief mode after the 2010 earthquake. Okay? This exposed me to lots of dangerous introspection and comparative analysis. I spent a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to be me living in the United States, the wealthiest country in this hemisphere? What does it mean to be here living with you know, these people in the poorest country in the, you know, the hemisphere of the planet? Okay? The good news is, as soon as I came home, the routines that I had set up, the life that I temporarily left and then came back to, I was able to slip right back into those routines and there were no lasting damaging effects. <laughs> Which means that as soon as you come back, you, you, you spend some time in the third world, you come home, routine will save you. You can go right back to worrying about how your new iPad doesn't warm your lap the way your mouth <laughs> Or even worse, that your soda is, is so large it might go flat when you <laughs> Both of these, by the way, are real posts collected from uh, firstworldproblems.com. <laughs> you too can go in and tell, you know, what's on your mind, what are you dealing with living here in the first world. Okay. So really I want to talk about how there's, you don't need new experiences. New experiences are accidents waiting to happen. You want to avoid them at all costs if you can. What about having fun? Isn't novelty an important ingredient in having uh, you know, a, a good time? It is. Okay. And I don't want to tell you you can't have fun. We just want to do it safely. Okay. There's ways that we can have fun. Uh, without uh, putting, putting you at risk. Okay? And, and uh, really, the answer is to let other people do your thing before you. <laughs> in, a la in laboratory conditions, we can dissect and then reproduce, manufacture, mass produce, and, and, and market inspiration in safe doses. Okay? There's no reason to go out there and go crazy by yourself. America actually excels at this, at prepackaged inspiration distributed measure doses. Think about how many times if you ever find yourself buying something or eating something or watching something or listening to something pre primarily because everybody else is doing it and you're being a good consumer. Uh, American. I mean a good American. <laughs> now, herd mentality, some people don't like that. If you'd rather dress it up, you can say group thing or even information cascade. Okay, that sounds a little bit, you know, a little more authoritative. Uh, but this is a tried and tested method. This is proven. It's a survival trait. So it happens all the time in nature. <laughs> because it's dangerous to leave the group. Leaving the group can have consequences. Okay? <laughs> Some of them very common. <laughs> you laugh, but it could happen to you. <laughs> now let's say you, you do get separated from the group. You wander off, you try anybody, it turns out to be dangerous. Is it over? It's not over. Okay? We can recover from inspiration. What, is, what does recovery look like? How do we move past this? Okay? Well, to begin with, you need to realize that you are way too busy to incorporate anything new into your life. Okay? We live in this miraculous time, a day and age, where we can be busy even when we have nothing to do. I, I, one of my favorite things to do, when I'm at home, I'm on my big couch, I've got my TV and my Xbox 360, I will have my iPad open and running Netflix so I have something to watch in between games of Halo 4. <laughs> you can have wall-to-wall -wall entertainment, there's no reason to stop. In fact, the connectivity that we enjoy as a civilization, society today, is unprecedented. We're so connected and wired in that you can, you can get involved, you can raise your voice, you can express an opinion, you don't even have to get up. Okay? With just a few mouse clicks, you can tweet, like, pin, or post, sign a petition, whatever, all the way up to a, a sort of a moral sense of well-being and benevolence, that you're involved, that you're active, that you're doing things without actually you know, leaving your chair. Okay? If you do have to get up, if you do leave your chair, that's all right, we just want to make sure you do it safely. <laughs> if, you, if you're going to get physical, you need to realize that there's, there's do's and don'ts. Okay? Amy Cuddy is a, social si uh, a sociologist, and she's uh, doing research into nonverbal expressions. That's all the things that are going on with your body that are indicating what's going on in your brain, and they might be unconscious, they might be happening without you even being aware. Okay? So what this means is that we can actually profile 
the physical descriptors of inspiration. Okay, what does phys- what does inspiration look like? Well, you want to be on your guard for these people. Okay? <laughs> Watch out for it. erect posture and brisk walking. Okay, <laughs> she's going somewhere. Okay, the, the quick head tilt is a classic indication of interest. Okay, because of the, the little birds. Okay? You, you've also got hands on hips. Okay, this is this is readiness or authority. Okay, this is these people are dangerous. These people are prone to doing things. You need to watch out for them. Instead, think about how you can cultivate a different frame of mind. Right? Let your let your hunched shoulders and your hands in your pockets sort of you know, change things. Let, the, let the, those arms fold in a defensive posture. Okay? Let that shape what's going on upstairs. Okay? Uh, the, 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 the long head tilt. Okay? That's a classic indication of boredom. I see some of that going on in the back. <laughs> Now, if you end up in the grip of inspiration, it's not necessarily game over. Okay? There's lots of opportunities in between when inspiration strikes and the idea comes to fruition. There's lots of opportunities to retreat to the safety of the couch before you end up just another sweaty jeans. Okay? <laughs> so Thomas Edison started in the process. So, one of the other tools we have to stop inspiration dead in this track is the reality check. Okay? Now this is classic, judgmental, left hemisphere thinking that comes from that part of your brain that's, that's extremely uh, 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 obsessed with the you know, details and orientation and, and making sure that uh, you, know, you can't change the world, you're just you. This isn't, this isn't your job. Somebody else will come along and take care of this. Yeah. So the reality check is a wonderful way to get started with stopping inspiration. If that doesn't work, we can always crank it up to death by details. Okay. Now this is also known as policy compliant or by the book. Okay. You can, if you're involved in a project that looks like it's going places, okay, you can actually obsess over the details to the point where all work grinds to a halt. Or even better, the project takes so long that the work is obsolete. Right? The world has moved on and left your project dead and on the right. Now, in this country, you got to go to school. Okay? And, you know, that's just, it's the law of the land. Attendance is mandatory. Okay? The concept behind education in this country is that ideas plus education or sorry, ideas plus experience equals education. But there's a loophole, okay? You don't have to actually get educated. Attendance is mandatory, learning is optional. <laughs> okay? they, they won't tell you this up front, but really, learning is not something that happens to you, it's something that you will do on your own or you won't do, okay? No one's gonna actually make you do it, right? And, and this is important because it turns out that school is, is a minefield. If, if you're not careful, if you don't watch your step, you can end up inspired. But if you understand that this is a system, it's a system that has rules, those rules can be learned and then exploited, you can actually make your way through school without learning all that much. Okay? <laughs> and the reason for that is the system is designed on 1900s factory, an uh, industrial factory model, because that's when public education rose in this country. We've got kids, we need to get them smart enough to get you know, down and working on the factory floor. So the model is outmoded and outdated. If you think about this, how many, how many things, how many leftover things do we see in your school on a daily basis that come from this model that hasn't been relevant for 100 years? We have bells to indicate shift changes. We're going to move back and forth. We've got separate facilities, math here, science there. Okay? We group students together by age. Why, why do we do that? Why do we group students by age? Is that because every 16-year-old has the same mental capacity and abilities as every other 16-year-old? No, no way. When I was in school, I was the skinny, sensitive, artistic kid. I didn't even have the same size as everybody else when I was 16. Okay? This is about standardization. Standardization is not about uh, educating you as an individual. It's about making sure that uh, uh, it's about convenience and mass production. Okay? We're going to get not just you, but you and everybody else is going to get through school here. Okay? <laughs> now, one of the other dirty secrets of education is that we don't know what the world is going to look like five years from now, let alone 10 years from now or even 20 years from now. So there is no guarantee that the education you receive today will even apply later on. Okay? Think about this. The teachers you have now, when they were in school, those people were educated with a view of world history that did not involve minorities or women. Okay? You wonder why they're always on about that stuff now? It's because from their point of view, it's new and exciting. <laughs> This is incredible. Not only were women and minorities present, they were actively making positive contributions to society. This is incredible. <laughs> Our world is changing. It will keep changing. And we can barely keep up. Okay, now, at the risk of exposing you to some dangerous information, we need to talk about where ideas come from so that we can more effectively avoid them.
Okay. There's this idea that, there, or the concept, that an idea is, a, is an aha moment, a light bulb, or the eureka moment. It is this, this, this single illuminating flash that happens, and now you're hitting a new idea. It turns out there's, a, there's some interesting research that indicates that, that perhaps that last, that big moment, is in fact the last act, this chain of events that's going on in your brain all the time. Okay? Think of like a, like a movie, you get to the end, there's a big twist, the reveal, and then like everybody's on stage now. Okay? You have to have all the stuff that comes before to get to that point. That is a wonderful TED talk by Stephen Johnson, where he brings up the, idea, the concept that an idea is a network. Okay? That when you have a new idea, it's a new configuration that's formed in your mind. Okay? The reason, what, what makes this possible is this structure. This is a part of your brain. You're a placental mammal, so you have this. Not everybody does. The corpus callosum is this thick, fibrous, it's a ropey bridge that connects the two hemispheres. It allows information to pass from the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere back and forth. Your two hemispheres have two very different jobs. As an art teacher, I'm always trying to get kids to work in the right hemisphere. Okay? The left hemisphere brings us math, music, science, counting, organizing things. The right hemisphere is adapt the adaptation, flexibility, interpretation, intuition. Okay? It's the information moving back and forth between these two hemispheres that lets new ideas be born. Okay? Now it turns out this structure, the corpus callosum, is not found in other animals. Birds don't have it, reptiles don't have it, fish don't have it, amphibians don't. You know why? They don't need it. Okay? All these creatures, these are all species that are living happy, productive lives without a corpus callosum, and you can too. <laughs> Think of it like it's an aftermarket add-on part. Okay? You bring this when you buy a little car with a ridiculous new big spoil on it, where you go and get those little, there, there's, they, there's a couple of inserts that are specifically designed to hold a container of fries. You can put these things in your car, but really, is it going to change the performance? Not all that much. So, what you want to watch out for in school is, is these teachers that have an agenda they are going to try to get you to use that corpus callosum, move information around your brain until an idea just sort of pops out spontaneously at the end. Robert Ward here, William Arnold Ward, uh, uh, says that the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and yeah, I, I can guess it, that the, uh, the great teacher inspires. Okay? So you, what you want to do is, first, if, if you can, from choosing classes, gravitate towards that top one. Right? The teacher that just tells what's going on in class and leaves it there, they don't have an agenda, they're going to take care of you, you'll be alright. Okay? When you're done with school, when it's time to leave here and go out into the world and, and look for a job, I would try to encourage you to steer yourself towards safe jobs. Look for a job that will protect you or shield you from dangerous innovation or creativity. And those jobs are all very common descriptors. Now you're looking for a place, maybe a little hostile work environment, the employees are drones, they've got mindless tasks, endless repetition, low customer satisfaction. Rude coworkers are always a plus. Okay? <laughs> These type of jobs, you get a job like this, you will, it's like the witness protection program for inspiration. It will never find you. <laughs> okay? You can't get much safer than that. You, you get a job that has all these things, congratulations, but you probably won't go anywhere. Right? You'll be there indefinitely. Okay? So really, if there's a, the, the takeaway from this is that you're as awesome as you need to be, so just keep being awesome, number one. I want you to avoid new experiences. Okay? They're no good. Number three, don't think too much. If you can remember those three things, you will be just fine. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Don't dare to be inspired.